it's such a beautiful study, very professionally done, but it has such a um, missing data point that it made me frustrated. Even before talking here, I was just going crazy to say to the um, authors that you had this data. Why did you not put it together? And the amount of slicing and dicing they have done in this study, they could have easily added the vaccination statuses as well. So here is a study. It is actually um, published today. It's in published in Nature. I'm going to tell you the study's title. I think after I go live and stop on the YouTube, then I can go and edit the description and add links. So if you wanted to just look at it with me right now, you can open it on your computers. The study's title, and my computer is here, that is why I'm looking there. The study's title is Long-Term Neurologic Outcomes of COVID-19. Long-Term Neurologic Outcomes of COVID-19. It is published 22nd September 2022, that is today. The authors are Evan Shu, Jan Ji, and Zayad Al Ali. Uh, Zayad Al Ali MD is, um, I believe, if I open up his uh, his profile quickly, Zayad Al Ali MD has led multiple studies on long COVID as a clinical epidemiologist at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis and Veterans Affairs St. Louis Healthcare System. His research has included devastating effects of the virus on the heart, kidneys, and mental health. So as I said before, very well done study. However, there is a, and I would share the study's data. However, please re realize there is an important thing missing in it, and that is the vaccination status. And you could, uh, I'll actually discuss why people are actually right now going about it with each other and debating each other that could there be vaccination data or not. And I wanna clarify that as well. So let's start. Maybe there is a way for me to kind of change this camera view to look at the computer screen, but it's just gonna be, um, not the best. So let's not touch this before I mess up the uh, this thing. So let's look at the results first. What they said was, they said we used Veterans Affairs Hospitals data from, I believe, let's see the dates. They took this data from, th there is one more thing I cannot highlight when the network is is not working and there is a tool that I use to highlight with the mobile phones network and once i stop the network with my computer as a personal hotspot and i'm speaking with you those highlights are gone so it's just <laughs> kind of a crazy day for me but i wanted to discuss so let's look at the cohorts these are millions of people in here so they're saying there were 5.859621 million participants, so almost 6 million participants in COVID-19. The contemporary control, so they did, I believe, three groups. COVID-19 contemporary control, that is people who are in the study time frame and were not infected. Then COVID-19 infected. And then a previous year before COVID-19 as a further control. They did a follow-up, median follow-up time in the COVID-19 contemporary and historical control group was 408 days. So almost more than a year. The data, I believe, that's what I wanna show you. So just give me one second. Um, I want to take this. So the, the time frame was from March, 2020 1st March 2020, very early on 2020, 
to 15 January 2021. March 2020 to 15 January 2021. Remember that the vaccination started somewhere in December and then they started ramping up after that. Now, during this time, March 1, 2020 to January 2021, 15 January 2021, during this time, anyone who became COVID positive, their T0 started, the time zero started. They also made sure that they only followed, followed up those who were alive from, <coughs> excuse me, from T0 to 30 days. So imagine if I was in their cohort, I became infected, and if I survived after 30 days, then they would follow up, and they would follow up for a year. So now here is the basic data, data presentation issue that I, I, I wanna be a little stronger, but I don't want to. Here is the problem. They said in their manuscript that we took the group of people in almost no vaccination time. March 2020 to January 2021 was almost no vaccination. So they said lesser than 1% of the people who became infected, meaning T0 was when they became infected, lesser than 1% were vaccinated but here is the missing part they followed them up from january till december or ahead of 2021 the whole year or even before january whenever they became infected after march 2020 it is possible that people would have taken vaccine once the vaccines became available and the, the follow-up continued till December 2021, many people would have become vaccinated during this time. That is what bothers me. They actually acknowledge the concept of vaccination to say that we wanted to have, if I read that exactly for you, So, here they say, because we aimed to examine outcomes at 12 months, our cohorts were enrolled before 15 January 2021, before SARS-CoV-2 vaccines were widely available in the US. And less than 1% of the people in the COVID-19 group and contemporary control groups were vaccinated before T0. T0 is the time when they became infected. This is the total they've talked about the COVID-19 vaccine. Now imagine, look at me, imagine me as an example. Let's say they're, they're looking at me from March of 2020. I become infected, let's say in September of 2020. In March of 2021, I become vaccinated as well. Now they're following up for 12 months. I report some issues. They are putting those all the issues as COVID infected cohort because the time I got the infection, I didn't have the vaccine. And those people who were infected after the vaccination rollout, and they were T0, meaning they became infected, only 1% were those who became infected after having the vaccine. But what is missing is those who became infected afterwards they had the vaccine as well. And why do I say that? Really, without looking at this whole study as vaccine, good or vaccine bad as a doctor it is a curiosity for me to say those who got the vaccine what kind of outcomes were there 
And the same group, Dr. Ali's team, did another study to say that breakthrough infections and the outcomes in those patients. That's a different study. This is a very valuable study. Let me show you some of the data points that they have. And I think you would agree with me that these are important data points to know. But you cannot actually see that this may have been anything to do with the vaccine at all. So let me read some data points. They looked at ischemic stroke. Ischemic stroke after becoming T0, after becoming positive and a follow-up of a year. What they're trying to convey in this study is that people who become infected develop neurological outcomes. And so here they have ischemic strokes compared to contemporary group which was not infected. The ischemic strokes are high in those who became infected. But with this slicing and dicing, they do not actually have the vaccination data. TIA, transient ischemic attacks, hemorrhagic stroke, cerebral venous thrombosis, memory problems, Alzheimer's disease, peripheral neuropathy, paresthesias, dysautonomias, Bell's palsies. Many of these actually are vaccine injured patients. Um, signs and symptoms too. I'm sure that these are also from COVID too. Wouldn't this be great at this time of the pandemic when we are almost getting out of it to have that kind of data available just as a doctor to understand this data, to understand the cohorts and the, the exposure of them or protection of them or the duration of the protection. But no, that one data point is missing. Epilepsy and seizures, headache disorders, abdominal involvement. These are all the ones, majority of those are higher compared to control groups, the incidences of those. Myoclonus, major depressive disorders, stress adjustments, anxiety, psych psychotic disorders, joint pain, myalgia, myopathy, hearing abnormalities, vision abnormalities, loss of smell, loss of taste, dizziness, somnolence, Guillain-Barre syndrome, encephalitis, transverse myelitis. You can imagine how, and they say that we have looked at, I think they said 400 uh, various factors to process. And that they said no other study has done that. And I, this is why I loved it. This is a great study. One more subgroup analysis if they had done. Let me show you, I cannot show you, but let me uh, explain what kind of subgroup analysis they have done, meaning how rigorous the work is. For example, age, lesser than 65, greater than 65. And for those ages, cerebrovascular disorders, cognitive disorders, disorder of the peripheral nerves, episodic disorders, you would really enjoy the data sets that they have. Mental health disorders, musculoskeletal system, sensory disorders, neurological related, any ne ne neurological outcomes. Then race, white, black, sex, male, female, obesity, no, yes, smoking, no, yes, ADI, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, immune dysfunction. They have done a lot of subgroup analysis. Which analysis is missing? Those who may have, and so to my awesome colleague, Dr. Ali, he has done very good work and lots of good studies. Just like Qatar has this data set on which they keep running their studies, I believe that Veterans Affairs Hospital's data set and Dr. Ali's work with that is creating a lot of good data as well. However, if in this data, just as a doctor, I'm not talking about the uh, any leaning, just as a doctor, I would have been so enamored to see how did various cohorts with their vaccination status did. They have one more table, figure three, risks and 12 months burden of incident post-acute COVID-19 composite neurological disorders. And they said here, compared to controls, neurological disorders were a lot for one year 
and the burden was excess burden per 1,000 persons. So for example, neurological, any neurological outcome, the burden seemed to be, if I read this correctly, somewhere about 22 per 1,000 extra. Then they have sensory disorders, that is extra as well, more than the control. Musculoskeletal disorders, more than the control. Mental health disorders, more than the control. Many other things in this one. Then they have figure two, risks and 12 months burden incidence post-acute COVID-19 neurological outcomes compared with the contem contemporary control. And they also have, let me see if I can change my, ouch, I knew this is gonna do some funny thing, but let's see if I can do this. Do you see this? Look at the, look at how beautifully they have presented these data points. If I can move this a little more. And so these are the data points. Great work done, lots of analysis done. Look at this, right? So if I now pull it back towards me, my frustration, I actually became very frustrated, annoyed maybe that I couldn't get that. Interestingly, they did another kind of vaccine analysis, and that was flu vaccine analysis. And they wanted to do that to kind of use them as a negative control to say that, hey, if you had the flu vaccine, what is your uh, um, neurological symptoms or outcomes possibility? But they didn't actually use the COVID vaccine to do the similar comparison. So I think it is good enough that I have complained let me now very quickly tell you the summary of their work. I have to go up to the main. So here is what they said. They said, the neurological manifestations of acute COVID-19 are well characterized, but a comprehensive evaluation of post-acute neurological sequelae at one year have not been undertaken. Here, we use the National Healthcare Database of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs to build a cohort of 154,068 individuals with COVID-19, 5.6 million contemporary controls, and 5.8 million historical controls. We use inverse probability, blah, blah, blah. So they go on and then they say, we looked at the burden of incident neurological disorders at 12 months following the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Our results show that in the post-acute phase of COVID-19 after the infection, there was increased risk of an array of incident neurological sequelae, including ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, cognition and memory disorders, peripheral nervous system disorders, episodic disorders, for example, migraines and seizures, extrapyramidal and movement disorders, mental health disorders, musculoskeletal disorders, sensory disorders, GB syndrome, gambari, encephal encephalitis, encephalopathy. We estimated that the hazard ratio of any neurological sequelae was 1.42. So 1.42 times higher risk of or likelihood of developing neurological outcomes compared to the controls. And burden 70.69 per 1,000 persons at 12 months. So an additional 70.69 people per 1,000 people in 12 months became uh, had these neurological outcomes. The risk and burden were elevated even in people who did not require hospitalization during acute COVID-19. And they actually had done hospitalization, non-hospitalization, and ICU sub-analysis too. The only sub-analysis that is missing, subcategory analysis that is missing, or cohort analysis that is missing, is vaccine status. Taken together, our results provide evidence of increased risk of long-term neurological disorders in people who had COVID-19. So this is it. I'm going to stop here. It's already 20 minutes on the phone. I do not even know how is it looking, but I wanted you to be aware of one thing. Let me repeat this one point. Yes, the, the study included people from March 20, 2020, till January 2021, that was largely the time when vaccines were not there or were getting rolled out in the almost end of, right, one month or so. However, the follow-up went 
till December 2021. So 12 months follow up from the day of infection. During that 12 months, it is possible that somebody who was in the time of not vaccination or not no vaccine, but then they see. I would suspect everyone got a vaccine after that. We are talking about veterans. So maybe majority of them got it. But anyways, that is the only one piece that is missing that almost makes this study beautiful and frustrating at the same time. So with this, thank you very much. I'm going to stop now. A few minutes later, I'm going to come back with one more data set for another study. I just cannot stay away <laughs> from you even when my network is not working. And my apologies for this less than best quality outcome here. But thank you very much. And please like, subscribe and share. Um, I'm going to leave. I would After this video, I'm going to edit the description to add the links. You can probably go to the links and check them out as well. I would see you in another about half an hour with one more study. Thank you and bye bye. I have no idea how to stop it. So I'm going to just press this close button. <laughs>